Hello there, everyone. How is everyone doing tonight? Yeah, I have you all muted, so don't answer that question. That's kind of that's kind of the point of the of the whole thing. So, the way this evening is going to work, um, I'm going to have you guys all muted, so I can just go ahead and blah 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 and talk. And then what you can do is if you have some questions during the um, during the presentation and such, you can use the chat feature um, on Zoom and go ahead and um, post your question there. And what I'll do is at the end, I'll gather all the questions. Our assistant winemaker, Andre Swart, is right behind us. He's kind of monitoring and he's gonna be looking at the, um, at basically uh, all of the questions or any comments that you guys are having. And then at the end, he'll go ahead and, and relay that to us. So if you guys do, would you uh, please just save your, your comments and, and questions till the end. Um, what we're gonna do is basically go through these three wines. So we have our, our Maple Vineyard Zinfandel. This is kind of the, the order I'm gonna go in tonight. We have our 2018 Maple Vineyard Zin. We're gonna move on to the Tina's block, which is inside that maple vineyard um, next. And then the final wine will be our Il Campo Estate Field Blend. Um, and that will be the last wine. And so what I'll do is I'll kind of like talk a little bit about each of the wines, each of their characteristics, maybe how you'd pair those wines um, with different foods as well. And then I'll kind of start sprinkling in other um, facts, give you a little bit of history about um, our, our winery, uh, give you a little bit of um, history on, on myself. Um, and yeah, and we'll kind of go from there. I also have a, a couple photos that uh, I'd like to just share with you guys probably somewhere uh, near the end. So you can just kind of get a better grasp of our, our process that we're, we're doing here. And so um, once again, thank you guys for, for joining us. I'm Brandon Lapidus. I'm the winemaker at Armida Winery. Um, and this night is, is very special for me. This is my first Armida Winery Zoom that we've done with, um, with our members. And this was actually born out of the idea of, of Passport. So our, our lovely event Passport was, was canceled again this year. It would be normally uh, this weekend that we'd have a, a band out on the deck and we'd be partying and tasting new vintages of Zinfandel, um, but that not, not to happen this year. And so Passport, they, they allowed a few people to um, re, uh, use up their tickets in a virtual manner. And so we scheduled to do this and I thought it was such a great idea that I went ahead and, and invited like the rest of our wine club uh, to join as well. And so I was overwhelmed by the response. It was very cool to see that you guys obviously love these wines and you guys um, hopefully want to learn a little bit more and kind of share the passion of, of Zinfandel. We're all kind of like this weird Zinfandel group here that just really um, appreciates the underappreciated variety that, uh, that Zinfandel is. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the 2018 Maple. So I always think that I sound a little bit better after a glass of wine too. So it's always kind of what are those things? And so my suggestion for you guys is if you have all these three bottles open tonight, uh, try and save a little glass of it overnight and you'll be actually probably pretty uh, surprised how great the wine is tomorrow. Uh, I normally think that with Zinfandels that they can age anywhere between you know three and, and 10 years and, and have a, a real good kind of ageability to them. A lot of these wines I would say are, are of that ilk because you just have a little bit um, lower alcohol in these Zinfandels, lower sugar, and that also results in a little lower pH. All these factors actually really help out um, and tribute to, um, to making the wine a little bit more age worthy. So here we are with, with the maple. I love this wine. <laughs> so it's always, it's always kind of fun to just look back because 2018, just a, you know, a different vintage. Um, it's kind of fun to see what your work was like three years ago. You almost kind of laugh at it, kind of looking back on yourself. But I, I love the aromas of this wine. Um, you get a lot of, of spice. I think that's driven from the barrels that we will choose for this. Um, the great part about maple is that we're able to do this cool blending with it. So it, the vineyard itself is about 26 acres, 
we, we, we pick about 16 of those 24 acres. And so when we go to bottle this wine, we only will bottle maybe about two acres of that 16 worth. So it's really kind of my job to go ahead and try and kind of select each barrel, the best barrels each year to um, kind of represent what that maple vineyard is going to be really allows the wine to kind of be really consistent from year to year for a single vineyard where normally you only have, let's say one acre and it's the same acre and you put in one tank. So with Maple Vineyard, the, the key to it, I think is, is the blending aspect where I'll actually pick um, some of the vineyard about a week before I would normally think it's at its optimal ripeness. And then also pick a little bit at the end, uh, about a week and a half after that optimal uh, ripeness as well. And you kind of are blending flavors almost out in the vineyard. You get a little bit more spiciness with like the underripeness, uh, the underripe uh, Zinfandel, a little bit lighter in color, a little higher in acidity. And then the later on, you get a little bit more of those dried fruit flavors. You're going to get pruniness a little bit, but all of it in the right amount seems to kind of work. So um, Oh yeah, I love it. Uh, so the key is we'll get those high barrels, let's say of Maple Vineyard, bottle about 25 to 30 of them as the single vineyard. So with those barrels, we'll actually choose like a wide variety of different, um, different oak coopers to use. So we'll use some American oak, we'll use some Hungarian oak, and then we'll also use some French oak on that wine as well. And anytime I have to, or like I'm trying to experiment with a new barrel, I'll try it on the maple vineyard first, because if it's great and I love it, then I'll go in the single vineyard. If it doesn't quite make the cut, you know, that I, that I kind of want, then it will go into our Dry Creek Valley blend, which just makes that wine that much better kind of thing. And so, like I said, maple vineyard is right in the heart of Dry Creek Valley right where Dry Creek Road and Litton Springs Road meet. So um, Ridge, Litton Springs, very famous vineyard and winery right there. It's about a mile away from, from Maple Vineyard. Um, and so right at this like kind of shelf, we call it, of, of Dry Creek, it's about a hundred feet above where the actual Dry Creek is. So it's sitting up on a shelf. And on that shelf, it just has this amazing well-drained soils. And so you can go out there after a day of rain and there won't be any mud that to your boots. It's all so sandy that all that, that water will go ahead and just porously just like fall through the soil down, down, down to the roots. And what that does is it allows these old vines to actually be 100% dry farmed. So there's not uh, an ounce of water from the reservoirs being used to, to produce these grapes just over the, the 100, well, the oldest block is 110 years old. The, the vines basically send their roots as far down as they can go. And with this soil being so porous, it can keep going and going. So we've actually dug up some old vines that have gone down about 30 feet in, in roots. And so even uh, in our current kind of situation in, in California right now, where we're headed into a drought, we're in a, we're in a drought, we didn't get um, the amount of rainfall that we, we normally get this, uh, this year and the year prior, it's, it's not going to really affect these, these, these vines too much. They've, they've seen years and years of droughts and fires and kind of everything. And that's kind of the, the great part there. They're just almost, they're like an old person. They really don't care about their external factors. They're just kind of really bent on just producing a few good clusters of grapes and those grapes end up being super concentrated in flavor. And that's why the old vines are always kind of so sought after. Um, just to do a, a little plug for, for some other wineries, Maple Vineyards actually does sell to five other wineries. So if you do like this maple, one of um, our favorite kind of like experiments, educational experiments to do is to grab everyone's expression or version of, of Maple uh, Zinfandel from that year and kind of compare what the, the different wineries and different winemakers did. So uh, Dutcher Crossing makes one, Mazzocco makes one. Um, I believe Lambert Bridge has on and off made one. We also have Bella does a, a great one as well. And I'm probably gonna leave someone out here, but, um, but those are all just like kind of a cool thing that 
it's almost like a collaborative effort that us winemakers get to work on this historical old vine vineyard and each get our own piece and our own way to kind of buy it. And so uh, it's, it's pretty cool. When we, when we go out there and we're starting to sample grapes, I always see all the other winemakers out there and we're always kind of like checking each other's numbers. And so it's fun to see when someone has picked or someone hasn't picked or kind of things like that. So um, so I, I love that kind of collaborative kind of feeling that you'll get out in Maple Vineyard. Um, and so how, how Maple was kind of started is that those 20, 24, 26 acres, the first two acres were planted in 1910, and we'll get back to that in a sec. But the other part of the, of the vineyard wasn't planted until after the 1930s. So we kind of got to think about the, the time of, of prohibition if we're kind of thinking about a, a Maple Vineyard. They didn't plant the bulk of it until that prohibition was done or right, right on like the ends of it. And so during that prohibition time, what happened is that we in Sonoma County actually lost about 75% of our, our vineyards due to the fact that farmers needed a profitable crop. And if they weren't able to sell the grapes for wine, um, then basically they had to rip them out and plant something else. So it wasn't until the, the mid 2000s that Sonoma County actually caught back up to the acreage that was planted pre-prohibition. So um, if you kind of can imagine how many vineyards we have right now, it would pretty much look the same in the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s until, until prohibition took hold. And it was one of those very interesting, you know, kind of things where Washington DC was, you know, making rules that Californians didn't really feel applied to them. So you obviously had a huge bootlegging, um, smuggling kind of um, industry that was born out of this, so out of prohibition. So I kind of like to picture myself back there and, and sometimes like to think that if prohibition were to happen today, that somehow I'd, uh, I'd end up being a, a renegade, you know, running from the law, making wine for people still. So, um, so it's pretty cool for me when I actually can make this wine where it has gone through prohibition, gone through a lot of this history of Sonoma County. And for me, that's kind of what really sets Zinfandel apart and really kind of makes Zinfandel really, really special is the fact that it's traditions, it's heritage, it's been grown in this valley for about 150 years. And so when I go to make that wine, it's, it's nothing that's really in a book. There's like a few things that I can help out, but for the most part, you're using like what techniques we've used in this valley for 150 years. So pretty much this, this valley started um, right around uh, the gold rush, 1850s, people started kind of coming and, and immigrating here to Tri Creek Valley, you had a huge Italian uh, immigration um, here. A lot of them thought that it reminded them of their of their homeland, the the kind of rolling hills, the the rivers, um, and so a lot of people were coming here to look for gold. And once that kind of dried up and didn't happen, they would start planting their own vineyard and their own and their own farmstead. And so it's pretty cool to see how many different varietals ended up kind of immigrating into to California at that time because you had Italian immigrants, you had French immigrants, you had Spanish immigrants. So everyone was kind of bringing their own like clone of, of vines with them and then kind of seeing what worked really well in California. And so there was Pinot Noir here, there was Cabernet, there was Riesling, there was all these varietals, but there was an obscure varietal from the south part of Italy called Primitivo that came over here and people started planting it. And I think it's just one of those things, it just made the best wine in this area. It was better than Pinot Noir, it was better than Cabernet. And so people just seem to, I think, be drawn to, to Zinfandel in a way that they weren't in Europe. It wasn't a very uh, popular varietal in Europe, it still isn't today. And so um, I think it's something about Zinfandel found its home in Dry Creek Valley where it can flourish it has that perfect amount of acidity in the wine, that perfect amount of tannin and, and black kind of fruits along with it. And, um, and so it's, I don't know, I always kind of like wonder how these vines stayed this whole time. And I think that the proof is in the pudding. It makes amazing wines. There's nothing that 
I really have to do besides just really guide these grapes to kind of make the, this great wine. And so for me, the kind of hallmark of this Maple Vineyard Zinfandel is kind of it's, it's cranberry kind of flavor to it. You really, the, the acidity is very noticeable, I would say, in this wine. And it definitely, with that acidity, definitely pairs really well with foods. It's going to actually really cleanse your, your palate very well. So, um, so I love drinking this wine a little bit on its own. But for me, it's kind of all about barbecue. I kind of talked a little bit in my email that I sent out to you guys where I did a little suggestion of doing maybe a, a savory versus sweet um, kind of flavor matchup. Pardon me. So, oh man, that's good. Um, so yeah, so with savory and sweet, what I really like to do is like, if you were to go savory with like, we, we use tri-tip out here in California, big, nice hunk of meat. If you put like rosemary and thyme and your black pepper on there, peppercorns, um, that's kind of what I would consider like a, the savory kind of, of flavor. And so what that kind of that spices and savoriness is going to do is it's actually going to bring out the other side of the wine. So bring out the fruits and, and more of the, the berry aspect of the wine when it's kind of contrasting with that, that savory flavor. And so then to kind of go to the contrast of that, if you were to go with more of like a, a sweeter barbecue sauce, maybe like a honey chipotle barbecue sauce, you're going to actually bring out a little bit more of the savory flavors in the wine when you're going to pair that because the fruit and the sweetness are going to kind of um, kind of like block each other a little bit. And then you're basically going to going to get a lot of that kind of the spiciness of Zen and a little bit of what I would call, yeah, kind of like a, a rosemary, almost kind of green uh, flavor to it. Um, so let's see what else with this maple. So, yeah, so so basically what we'll do and kind of to, to walk you through like what um, a year in a winemaker kind of kind of looks like right now and kind of the current status is everything has basically finished up bud break. So all the vines are, are now awake. They all have branches on them um, that are at least about a foot tall. You can begin to see um, the little uh, flowers about to ready to emerge. Um, and so like within the next month, we're going to head into flowering, which is kind of a real crucial part for, for these vines. Um, it's going to just kind of determine what size crop we actually end up getting. So if we have any like deterrence during this, which would be like too much rain, too much moisture, any like too much cold, like a, a frost snap would, would really hurt it right now. All those things could lead to not having a, a good fruit set. Also, not having much water in the water table actually can also lead to it, it being a little bit smaller. So we kind of hold our breath for this next month. And then uh, right at about the beginning of June, you'll start to see the little berries show up. They'll be green for about the next four or five weeks until we get to this process called veration, which is where all of the grapes begin to soften up a little bit. And then the red grapes begin to actually change color. So you actually begin to see them change from green to red. Um, and that kind of gives us, it's almost like nature's uh, kind of alarm clock for us winemakers. Because from then on, it's pretty much about six to seven weeks from that veration when we'll be picking. So if we get veration around a little bit after July 4th, then we'll probably be picking right around Labor Day um, for uh, uh, in September. If it's a little bit later than that, uh, then yeah, we'll start pushing things into mid-September, even, even late September. So in the 2018 vintage that we're drinking right now, pretty stellar year. There's really nothing that I, <laughs> winemakers could kind of complain about and there wasn't much the growers could complain about either so it was kind of one of those um great harvests where if there's no complaints it means it's a fantastic year <laughs> so we had just uh, a normal cool spring and summer um Verasion happened normally right around mid-july and we ended up starting to pick um maple vineyards on september 15th which um is i would consider it a little bit late um later than normal also, once again, considering that that was like probably a week before I thought it was like optimally uh, ripe. So 
Um, so yeah, so all three of these wines were actually picked in the, the second or the third or fourth week of September. Um, and then Maple probably bled just a little bit into that, that first week of, of October. But yeah, pretty perfect year where we were trying to, um, we were picking everything right about 24 or five. Um, things would just soak up a little bit. There wasn't much raisining. The acid was, once again, just a little bit more of the hallmark of this vintage, I would say, because we did have that, that cooler summer. And so you didn't get as much of the sugar ripening. And so that then, you know, so then basically you didn't have as much of your acids actually depleting. So you ended up with just a good balanced wine. And so I'm really excited about these 18s. We bottled them about a year ago. And so um, they're just starting, I feel like, to get into their, their kind of like peak. They're going to, they're gonna, I think, for the next two, three years, um, be right where you kind of want them to be able to share and drink. And then if there's a, a couple that you want to tuck into the back of the cellar to see how long they go, I always think that's, that's pretty cool. We've had some customers recently share a, a 2015 maple they just had, a 2013 Tina's block. So um, some of these are, are pretty cool and they're fun to actually see how they will uh, kind of evolve and, and progress as, as they kind of go. Um, and so once we kind of, to get back to kind of like my, my season, once, once uh, Verasion happens, I'm going to start being out in the vineyards um, every week, sometimes two, three times a week as we start getting closer to harvest. And it'll be up to myself and Andre to go ahead and really look at the, um, at the vineyard and then also grab samples. So, and it, it sounds like a very scientific thing, grabbing samples, but all we're doing is we're grabbing just a five gallon bucket. We'll cut off maybe 15 to 20 random clusters um, throughout a block. And then um, what we'll do, bring it on back to our laboratory here, crush up those grapes as much as we can, separate all the, the juice from that, taste the juice at that point, look at the skins and seeds, see, what, um, see how much maturity you can kind of determine from just looking at it, whether it has maybe brown seeds, like, a, um, like it's starting to get, that's kind of if it has green seeds, it's a little underripe still. Um, so you're hoping that you can actually get real brown seeds and that the the grape is actually phenolically mature as well as being like mature with sugar and all that as well. So um, and so if I determine that it's it, it's tasting right, it's kind of we're we're seeing the trend. We've seen our our samples from the the weeks before, and so. At this point, what I'll try and do is schedule the, the pick. And so um, it always takes a lot of coordination between us and the growers. Um, their job is to go ahead and, and deliver the grapes uh, the best they can. And my, um, my requirement is <laughs> that they do that as well. And so I usually am working with them to just kind of figure out what's the best day that I can go ahead and have everything kind of work out as perfectly as possible, where you have your driver all set to go, you have your crew ready to go early, early, early in the morning so that the grapes can be picked really cold. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I would say, so that's, that's kind of the key. And it's always um, a give and take with these, with these growers. But, um, you know, for maple um, that we've been buying fruit from them for about 23 years now. So um, I don't know. It, it's not like every year I would say it, it's routine, but we do have some of the bumps and bruises figured out and kind of leveled out, um, I would say. Um, so the way uh, Maple Vineyard got his name is actually from Tom and Tina Maple. So they um, they bought the vineyard in the in the 1970s. It was a little run down. It wasn't as it is today, just pretty much immaculate and, and perfect. And so what they had to do is start replanting a few of those vines. Um, you'll see a few babies kind of still out there, but a lot of those babies that they planted in the 70s are now, you know, almost 50 year old vines. So they're, they're not quite as big as the other ones, but they, they still look like big old, um, big old Zinfandel vines. And Tom and Tina, this is their, their second career. They were just um, looking to kind of get out of San Francisco and, try and find the farming life and um, they, they found it and they embraced it. And it's just very cool to see someone that is uh, matches my passion for making Zinfandel 
as they do for growing Zinfandel. Uh, they have a ledger book going back to the mid seventies with um, you got annual rainfall, you have average temperatures, you have when bud break happened, flowering, veraison, harvest, all these cool data uh, points and facts that pretty much just kind of shows you how into it they were. And so they were out there every year, they're pruning, they're harvesting, they're going ahead and, and plowing uh, the soil, they're planting a cover crop, um, all these things. So it became for them just the, their true passion. And um, I was fortunate enough in 2010, met Mr. Tom for my first time uh, when I got here to Armida. And I think we, we chatted for about three minutes and he kind of looked at me and he said, you're going to make the best wines out of Maple Vineyard. And I was, <laughs> I was kind of taken aback for sure. And it, I had improved anything at that point, but uh, Tom Maple kind of gave me that, that assurance, that, that confidence there. Um, and just, just a, a, a great guy that for me, taught me, taught me a lot for um, my educational background. I didn't do much on the viticulture side. A lot of it was just, the fermentation and the production side of, of winemaking. So whenever I get in contact with anyone who knows their vineyards, I love to just pick their brains. And Tom was uh, more than willing to share his information with me. And so uh, 2015 was unfortunately Tom's uh, last vintage with us. Uh, his wife, Tina, still lives on the property. She still um, manages her two acre block. And that kind of seems like a natural segue onto Tina's block since we're, we're kind of going. So don't mind me, I'm actually gonna pour a little wine out. I know, I know, I know, how could I? And we are gonna go on to our 2018 Tina's. Um, this is the one, this is the wine where if I was stuck on an island, this is what I'd be drinking. So. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people ask me what my favorite wine is, and it is uh, definitely Tina's Block. If I needed a white wine, Sauvignon Blanc, but we're not talking about that today. <laughs> so, um, the thing that I love about Tina's Block is, once again, just to go back to the history, the history and tradition. So this is the oldest block that was planted in, in Maple Vineyard. So it's as close to their, their house as as possible, it was basically the original owner's front yard vineyard. It was what they made their, their home wine out of. So it's two acres only, two acres, that's it in the world. And um, those two acres were planted in 1910. So 1910, so we're gonna hit 111 years this year, which is just mind boggling to me. And uh, the thing that's also mind boggling is that I think with a lot of these old vines and, and um, old Zinfandels, people love to kind of almost brag about how little of a crop they produce. Like, oh, this only produced about one and a half tons per acre. Like they're struggling so hard. These vines on Tina's Block are 110 years old and they're just flourishing. It's a weird garden of Eden out there where we'll still get like a normal crop that you would get from regular irrigated vines and these don't have any water. So it's um, it's kind of like a, almost an anomaly. Like I don't normally see this when I'm visiting a lot of old vines in Findel vineyards. So, um, so that number one is just kind of what's so special. Um, going back to that time in 2010, when I, when I got to meet uh, Tom and Tina, just walking through Tina's block just gave me the goosebumps. It was just, there's something just really special and, and unique out there. And um, the key to it, the, the kind of uniqueness of it is the fact that it is a field blend. So can give me one second. I want to taste this wine real quick before I start describing it. Oh, I love that one. So the only record that we have of Tina's block, because we have the official Sonoma County like record of it being planted in 1910 was to two acres of Zinfandel. And so that's the only official record we have. When you go there right now, you can walk through and you can see that it's, it's not 100% Zinfandel. 
Um, there is multitudes of different varietals out there that are almost as old, I would say, as, as the Zinfandel. So you have varietals such as Petit Syrah, uh, Carignan, you'd have a little Cinso out there. And there's like a few um, Alicante Boucher vines. And um, each one of those different varietals kind of adds like a different um, kind of like flavor and texture and kind of structure to this, this Tina's block. So some people have probably had a Petit Syrah on their own, maybe, you know, a Zin on its own. Carignan gets pretty rare. Alicante Boucher, I don't think too many people are making a solo version of that. But, um, but you'll see with these old vine vineyards and it's kind of depends on what spot you are in Sonoma County as to what's interplanted with the Zinfandel there. So if you go up to the Northern part of um, Sonoma County and even into Mendocino, it gets a little bit warmer there. The Zinfandel had plenty of color, but what would happen is that it would start to lose its, its acidity. And so what they would plant along it is Carignan and Carignan is these bigger grapes, really kind of thin skin. They don't add too much color to the wine at all, but they are just juicy and really um, kind of like bring that, that acidic kind of lushness to the wine. Whereas if you're planting Zinfandel further south in Russian River, where you have, you know, cool climate, mostly Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, most of the old vine vineyards down there, you're going to find Petit Syrah grown alongside it. And Petit Syrah, really um, thick skinned grape, you're going to get a lot of color and tannin out of it, really just dark, dark wine. Um, and so kind of when you blend that with that Zinfandel that's grown in a cooler climate where that Zin will have plenty, plenty of uh, acidity to it, but just a little bit lighter on the color. So it's pretty much kind of like filling in what the, the Zinfandel was lacking. And to kind of say what I did before, I think Dry Creek is kind of the perfect spot for, for Zinfandel where you can actually have either one of those kind of varietals um, planted along, alongside Zinfandel and they're going to help out in kind of different ways. Um, that last varietal that I uh, mentioned, uh, Alicante Boucher, is um, kind of a, a relic of Prohibition times. And I, I just kind of love telling this story, but before um, Prohibition, like I said, a lot of Zinfandel in Sonoma County, almost none Alicante Boucher. Prohibition hits, and one of the biggest things where vineyards can still sell their grapes is actually to sell the grapes, put them on rail cars, ship it to Chicago, New York, Florida. People were going, buying grapes, and then making their own wine um, in their bathtub or garbage can or whatever they could you were allowed up to 250 gallons of, of wine on your per like adult um, each year. So that's like 110 cases of wine. So it's, it's like plenty of wine. <laughs> and so it's this kind of crazy loophole in the Volstead Act that you were able to um, make up this, this amount of wine. So everyone just started buying grapes. Zinfandel, unfortunately, pretty thin skin, didn't travel really well in rail cars. And so even though people made a great wine, it just, yeah, it was more prone to rot. Alicante Boucher, if you ever get the chance, it's one of the few varietals where the pulp inside of the grape is actually blood red. So if you go ahead and squeeze that grape right now, it looks like you're, you're basically bleeding out of your hand. Um, whereas every other 99% of, of the grape varietals out there, the pulp is, is white. And so when you squeeze it right away, it's just going to be pretty much clear juice. And so you can imagine that if the pulp's red already, that if you try to make a red wine out of it, it would be super dark. And so with those thick skins, they were able to transport really well by rail car. But then also you could imagine how much water you could probably dilute with these grapes to make a little bit more wine, add a little bit more sugar, a little bit more water and it's still made just a, a red wine. Um, and so at, so Alicante Boucher started flourishing in, in Sonoma County during prohibition times. And almost as instantly as prohibition ended, Al Alicante ended. And it pretty much comes down to that people in Sonoma County knew that Zinfandel made a far superior wine than Alicante did. And so once they didn't need that to actually transport those grapes that Alicante got pulled out. And so um, you'll find some of them like these old vines every now and then 
um, kind of spotted around, but um, there really is very, very few of them. And it's kind of just one of those almost, almost left, uh, I feel like for like historical significance, which I, I think is pretty cool. And so with this Tina's block, you end up, and it's kind of a, a guess that, that I have, but I think it's about 80% Zinfandel grapes in there. Um, I'd say about 10% Petit Syrah, and then 10%, you got the mix of Carignan and Cinso and, and Alicante. And so for me, uh, when going to, to pick this vineyard, this is actually one of my most difficult uh, decisions that I have to make uh, as far as when to pick this, because you do have all these different varietals and they're all kind of getting ripe at, at different times. So it's kind of hard and almost sometimes you just kind of have to close your eyes and just kind of uh, guess at a, at a great date for um, when it will, when it will be perfectly ripe and not overripe and not underripe. And so through the years, I've definitely had a, a learning experience, I would say with, with Tina's block about when to pick it, when not to pick it. Um, and part of that, I got to give credit again to Miss Tina Maple. Her and Tom always made at least two barrels of their, their own wine each year, kind of once again, keeping that tradition and that uh, heritage alive. And so they, they like their wines a little bit, um, picked a little earlier than I would. And so they would always tell me when they'd pick, they'd invite me over, I'd get to see what the grapes look like, taste the juice and everything and get their numbers. And so, um, so instead of having like a little five gallon bucket, I ended up, you know, with about a, a, thou, uh, a thousand pound uh, sample that way. And that really did kind of help me and kind of uh, guide me in, in my decisions. But you'll see there's different years where sometimes the maybe the Petit Syrah is riper, you end up with a darker wine. Sometimes the Carignan is in higher percentages, you end up with a little bit more floral, a little bit more lush of a wine um, kind of here. And so I, I love this 2018. I feel like it's kind of um, right in that perfect spot. It was actually the first block of maple that we picked in 2018 was the Tina's block. So um, it took it took kind of that decision to that I knew that it was ready at that time because I didn't really quite have all those other tanks of maple to really kind of judge the, the vintage and how it was going. Um, and so with this Tina's, um, we'll put this in 100% French oak. We'll ferment it in a closed top tank. So what we'll do is once the, the grapes are all picked early in the morning, nice and cold, they get delivered to our winery. Um, and then we'll put them through this, what we call a, um, a vibrating shaker table. And so it's a, it's a whole table that, that vibrates like this. And so the grapes kind of, kind of shuffle on, on down on them. And I have one rule uh, when it comes to sorting. And that is if you wouldn't want to eat it, then you got to throw it out. And it's uh it's pretty simple as, as far as that goes, but it's kind of also the key for us smaller wineries where we're able to kind of like differentiate ourselves is that we do sort out in the vineyard when they're picking, we're making sure there's no leaves, we're making sure there's no rot out there. And then we go ahead and do that once again um, here at the winery. Uh, and so by the time the, the grapes actually make it into the tank, they've gone through like a few like selection processes that have definitely kind of weeded out the bad, uh, bad ones at that point. Um, and then when we go to ferment, kind of the, the key, I told you about the, the cool temperatures that we want to pick that. And the key is when we, when we get the, the wine, the grapes all into the tank, what we're going to try and do is do a cold soak for about four to five days. So we have refrigeration that goes around our, our tanks um, and we'll turn that on to try and chill the tank um, out as, as much as we can, try and get it down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. This will actually prevent most fermentation from happening. And it really allows the wine to go ahead, almost like a, kind of like a, a, if you can think of a tea bag, it's just the longer that the grapes are in contact with that juice, kind of, kind of the better, the more color is gonna come out of it at that point hopefully more flavors um, is going to extract out of that. But the thing is, is that when it, when it's at that point it's cold soaking, there's zero alcohol in the wine. So you're really not extracting any harsh kind of um, parts of the wine. There's no seed breakage or anything like that. Whereas if we, at the end of fermentation, when you have, let's say 14, nine alcohol or whatever it is on this wine, um, you're going to begin extracting a lot more. And so, if you have bitterness in the seeds and you're moving them all around, that's going to end up in the wine. So 
kind of my goal is to try and do as much work as we can on the wine at the beginning. And then as we start getting closer to the end of fermentation, just really kind of like back down on it. So after about four days of that cold soak and preventing any fermentation, I'm going to go ahead and add my yeast on in. So we have like a very kind of specific formula for, for um, rehydrating yeast, but it would be just like yeast you would normally see if you were making bread. I could, I could take Fleischmann's bread yeast and ferment wine with it. So it's kind of all the, all in the same um, kind of process as that goes. We turn off the cooling and then we kind of wait for the fermentation to kick off. And over the, like the next three or four days of the yeast starting to build up its population, as those yeasts are fermenting the wine, they're actually creating a little bit of heat. And when you start talking about how many yeasts are in this uh, tank, let's say nine tons of tinas, you have billions upon billions and billions of yeast cells out there doing this work. And when they start working, they create a little bit of heat. And so that 50 degree tank will turn into 85, well, possibly 90 degrees if we don't actually cool it down anymore just from the, the yeast fermenting them. So talking again about that extraction, the warmer you get also, the more you're gonna extract out of it, um, out of that wine. So, um, so when you're at 50 degrees and, and no alcohol, perfect. When you're at 85 degrees and a lot of alcohol, don't touch it. So that's a big way for me to really kind of keep the tannins that are in this wine really soft. And, th and that's kind of the, the key with the wine is that it's approachable then at a very young age. It still has the capability to have um, the age ability to, to kind of um, keep going. With Tina's block, I will age this for, um, uh, we're almost at about 16 to, to 18 months. Uh, and I'll do 100% French oak on that with about 40% of those barrels being new. So if I have, let's say 20 barrels of Tina's block, Eight of those barrels are, are new barrels that have never touched wine before. Maybe another eight of them are one and two year old barrels that have seen wine before. So they're just not as oaky. And then the last four will be, um, will be three years uh, or, or older. I'll use barrels here. Um, I'm trying to see an example. Here's 2018. So 2015, uh, 2016, I would say uh, is probably the oldest barrels you'll find in here. After about three years, I think you lose any like oaky flavor that those barrels are going to impart on the wine. Um, but some, sometimes I'd like to just keep them a little bit longer because even just storing uh, a wine in a, in a neutral barrel, what we'd call a neutral barrel that has no more oak flavor to it, the magic is still in the evaporation of the barrel itself. So what happens is, you know, with, with oak, it's actually water is evaporating out, out of the, the barrel um, constantly. And so um, a big part for Andre and I during these, like kind of off, during the off season when we're not picking and, and fermenting is we go through and we have to actually top all these barrels because our biggest goal is that we want the first time for this wine to touch oxygen is when you're going to be popping the cork. So, and, all the other times we're trying to use either gas, inert gas to provide a layer so there's no oxygen or keep things topped up. So as the wine kind of goes down, we'll actually top it back up so that there's no headspace, there's no more air touching the wine. We'll do that every four weeks. Um, and every four weeks we'll lose, it's about a, it takes about a bottle of wine to top up each barrel. So we kind of call that the, the angel share. Uh, we lose a bottle per barrel um you know each month so um so once again even if you are in just a, a neutral barrel um the evaporation is actually concentrating the wine and, and all of its flavors where if you had it just in a stainless steel tank or whatever you wouldn't have that that kind of process um happening and so why don't i quickly chat about my history just real quick and then We'll kind of tie that into um, going on to our Il Campo. Um, I got into the, the wine industry um, kind of a, a little bit on a whim, I would say. Um, my grandparents collected wine. Um, they lived down in, in Los Angeles area. He bought a couple wine fridges during the 60s and 70s. They actually had wine groups. 
um, that would meet monthly and they they'd bring their own wine. And we're talking, um, you could still get like fantastic Bordeaux and Burgundy uh, bottles, including California Cabernets for pretty reasonable prices kind of back then. And so, um, so me growing up, whenever it was a birthday, an anniversary, a celebration, and we were down uh, celebrating with my grandparents, it was always kind of this mystical kind of procedure it felt like to uh, selecting the wine, standing the wine up, getting the decanter out, getting, you know, making sure that no sediment got in it, everyone trying it, everyone talking about how the wine opens up and how it's evolving throughout the night. And me just being a kid, it just, um, it, it just sounded just so mysterious and, and kind of cool for me. And so uh, during high school, I was pretty good, I'd say, in, in math and science. Um, and um, when I was 14, my mom uh, ended up going back to school, got her a culinary degree, just kind of as a, I kind of call it a midlife crisis for her, but it was a good crisis that, that helped everything out. So I kind of, my dad, he's Mr. Uh, Mr. Physics. So he has his master's in solid state physics. So kind of have this weird uh, math and culinary kind of mashup that kind of happened during my high school years. Um, and so when I was kind of choosing um, possibilities for different universities. I saw that UC Davis offered a fermentation science uh, degree and I checked the box. I thought it sounded cool. <laughs> I thought, I thought personally it was a little loophole in the government that I, uh, they were actually going to teach me how to make alcohol before I was 21. Um, and for some reason I got accepted into it. And I started loving it. It was awesome. It was everything um, that I wanted as far as like mixing the, the culinary and the like kind of almost uh, intangible artistic side of it with like the solid set of numbers and chemistry and things. Um, and then the, the other part that I, that I did, like said before that I didn't get to experience is the whole viticulture and horticultural side of it. And the fact of just the, the growing of the, the plants, this whole kind of cycle that we kind of have here. Uh, and so 2003, I ended up taking the fall quarter off working at a winery called Testarossa Vineyards in Los Gatos, high-end Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, and I was the low man on the, the totem pole. So I was scrubbing barrels, scrubbing tanks, cleaning everything. Um, and I fell in love with it. It was awesome. I ended up being in the best shape of my life. I was working seven days a week, 16 hour days. We were just, I was tired, but the happiest I had ever been. And it was, it was at that point I knew, okay, like uh, I'm going to probably go this, this wine route. Cause with fermentation science, it actually taught me how to make cheese and soy sauce and beer and champagne and, you know, anything that, that kind of ferments. So you kind of, I could have gone into a few different industries. So 2004, did a, another internship working for R.H. Phillips. Um, got to get a little bit of a vineyard side of it on that. They had about 3,000 acres planted, um, big winery. And so I got to like sample grapes on an ATV. And so then the next year, I knew I was going to graduate Davis in December because I had taken that, that fall quarter off. I proposed to uh, my wife in, in December, and then we went off to New Zealand in January of 05 to um go travel and do do a harvest internship um i love sauvignon blanc and so that was kind of my holy grail i was trying to find the, the holy grail of sauvignon blanc down there in new zealand um and so after that which was a great experience um was just looking for another harvest job and um came across pt canyon winery down in paso robles they uh, specialize in, in Zinfandel. Um, and so I was looking for a harvest job and they had their assistant winemaker just quit. And so the guy's like, well, how about you're the assistant winemaker? So all of a sudden at age 23, um, I had my first full-time job where I was assistant winemaker for about 70,000 cases, mostly Zinfandel, no white wine, all, all red wine. And I couldn't have asked for a better situation. The, um, the owner and the, the, the winemaker were all part of the family, but the winemaker had gotten his degree in English. Um, he had worked on the family winery his whole life. So he, he knew how everything worked, but he didn't have the, the scientific kind of background and experimentation kind of background. So he just kind of pushed that all on my plate and was like, here's your playground for a couple of years, go for it. 
and I learned so much. It was awesome. And uh, so then actually knew I figure would come back to or come up to Sonoma County uh, at some point, got offered a job to be assistant winemaker at Goldfield Winery here in Sebastopol. It's again, high-end Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but they also had an acre of Old Vine Zinfandel uh, called Morelli Lane. And it's um, it was kind of another thing that's kind of driven me to this passion for Zinfandel is that Dan Goldfield, the winemaker there, had also a, an unknowing passion for Zinfandel. He, he was going on a bike ride through West County, Sonoma, and noticed this old vineyard that had just been bought by the Duttons had all this old Zinfandel on it. And he pleaded with them because they, they want to plant Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. He pleaded with them, please save me an acre. And so if you look at this vineyard, it's about 20 acres. Right in the center, there's one acre old vines in, and then there's all this, you know, perfect Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir planted. But um, I was when I kind of saw that passion also for, for Zinfandel from someone who mostly, you know, was, was passionate about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And that was, that was really cool. And then 2010, I just responded to a, a winemaker wanted ad out here in, in Armida Winery. I had uh, three interviews with uh, Bruce and Steve Cousins, the two brothers that still own and, and operate the, the winery today. Um, and I was, yeah, I guess I'm trying to like, what story do I have? <laughs> but um, pretty much, you know, in my third interview, they had me bring three wines that I had helped make and that I considered to be the style of the wines that I wanted to make here. And um, I think at that point they were, they were pretty blown away. So um, if you can imagine, I was 28 years old and they hired me to be the uh, head winemaker here at Armida. Um, that, once again, that was 2010, just finished my 11th harvest here. Um, it's, been, it's been a ride, it's been fantastic. Um, obviously we just had an amazingly challenging year this last year, but it kind of, forced me to get out of my own comfort zone of just making uh, wines and actually start learning how to, you know, draft emails, learning how to do these Zooms and virtual tastings and stuff. So it's felt pretty cool to be able to kind of um, in our in our winery kind of adjust and kind of uh, kind of change positions a little bit to kind of still help you customers out and still help the, the winery out as well. And so let's go ahead and let's go on to our Il Campo, which is, uh, I just love it. It's, it's a fun wine for me. It's the wine on our estate. It's, it's the grapes we see every day. So um, every day we're, we're driving up our, our driveway, we get to see that progression. And so um, for me, this is, this is pretty cool because it's kind of showing you the passion that Bruce and Steve had towards maple vineyards and the heritage and traditions of Zinfandel that they then applied to their, their own land here. So, so Armida, where we're, we're situated here in, in Healdsburg, California, um, it's about 14 acres that our winery is on. And all that land wasn't used at all for, um, for vines up until 1999. And Bruce and Steve um, laid out the plans for them to plant six acres of um, of fruit here, and so they had they had to kind of come up with an idea of what to plant, and so they kind of went with the whole idea of the field blend of, of Tina's block. They love that idea that you kind of can whatever you grow out there on the field, you put it all into one tank, you try and make the best wine out of it each year, and that you're gonna like appreciate the differences that are going to be um, apparent from vintage to vintage because you are going to have differences in in just kind of the different pockets and the different blocks and even for us the the different varietals so along our hillside they planted five acres of Zinfandel we have like a lower block that goes through a nice knoll um, and then we have a very vertical uh, looking upper block of, of Zinfandel um, and then on the other side, kind of of the winery, we have one acre planted of Petit Syrah. And so, like I said before, we try and find that perfect day. And this, this decision is, is no easy one either, because you do have those two varietals that are in pretty high amounts um, with each other. So, um, so for me, this wine ends up being about, I say, 
It's about 80% Zin again. I say it's 18% Petit Syrah and then 2% mixed blacks. Um, mixed blacks kind of goes back to what I was talking about with Tina's. It can be Cinso, Carignan, Petit Syrah, Alicante. So um, we have had, you know, some vines that won't take. They've actually, um, you know, they'll, they'll die after, let's say, 10 or 15 years, something like that. And so what will happen is that we'll replace them with, instead of Zinfandel, we'll start doing this kind of field blend and start adding Carignan. So I think we're up to about 2% of that other kind of Carignan and, and Alicante in there. But you'll notice with this wine, with it being that 18% Petit Syrah, this, this is by far one of the, the biggest wines that we have as far as just mouth and structure. And so, um, so we have a kind of couple things working here. You have a, a little bit of ripeness, giving you a little bit higher alcohol than the other two wines. And then you also have that cool climate. So we're about 10 minutes south of Maple Vineyard. So we're headed actually on, our, on the way to Russian River Valley. You end up a lot more fog in our area. It takes these vines a little bit longer to get quite as ripe. So you get that acidity, that real kind of strong kind of real tartness to it. That's actually balancing out everything in this wine. So I kind of call it big because it is, it feels like it has a lot of tan, a lot of fruit, a lot of acidity, but it's all kind of imbalanced, but it's a lot of it. So um, here we go for the taste real quick. Oh yeah, that needs the steak. It needs the steak, yeah. The great part about it, when you get something that has a nice little fattiness to it, um, the tannins that are in this, this wine really cut through those tannins, I'd say, or cut through the, the fattiness of the, of the meat really well and actually kind of clears your palate to each uh, kind of bite you're taking kind of is like that original attended, intended kind of flavor for it. The other thing I really like about this wine is, is the barrel choice that we get to make with this. And so um, I've had uh, a, one of our vendors, one of our um, people who sell our barrels, they've actually designed an, an app that I can play with where I can actually design my own barrel as far as what toast level I want and also what kind of wood I want in it. And so he told me I could kind of go as crazy as I wanted. And so when I was starting to think about it, what can I do? I love French oak. I love American oak. I love kind of Hungarian. So what we ended up doing, we ended up making like, I call it a little Frankenstein barrel. But along the body here, we alternated between American and Hungarian oak. So this, this stave was American. This one was Hungarian. And so it kind of was half and half. And then the, for the barrel head, this was all French oak. So it actually had all three kinds of the oaks in there. And then we did two different types of toast levels on it. One of them is what I call more of a, a flash kind of uh, toast, almost like if we were to kind of like sear our steaks. So you go really hot at the beginning, almost get a little bit of, of browning and, and caramelization of the, the sugars that's in the wood. And then also, and then the other kind of toast, I'm sorry, and then after you do that really hot searing, then you go ahead and lower the fire for a long time. So it kind of like cooks that through. Um, and then the other one we'd use is kind of what we'd call like a standard medium plus. And that's just a medium sized fire that's for a certain amount of time, a pretty long time, but there's no real like changes in, in temperature uh, during it. And so uh, kind of the same thing, 40% new oak on it. I'll get about eight of those new barrels. That's the only wine I put into uh, those barrels. So it feels pretty cool that it's like a, a barrel I designed for grapes that my, my two bosses had basically kind of had the idea and kind of birth child for. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool. And so, um, so yeah, to give you just a real quick little history about Armida, Bruce and Steve Cousins came in here. We're at about 27, 28 years ago right now, 1993. Uh, was was the first uh, vintage that they had. There was a previous owner, his name was Bob Frigoli. His grandmother who was born in Italy was named Armida. And so he had named it after her. He, uh, Bob Frigoli owned like actually about 200 acres of vineyards. So this was like for him, he mostly sold grapes, but then he was like, cool, why don't I start a winery? Maybe I can also like sell wine. And it took about four or five years for him to be like, no, thank you. That's not... <laughs> And so Bruce and Steve kind of came in here and this is kind of on a whim. Steve Cousins had been um, 
on the sales side of wine. He had worked for Chimney Rock. He had done a lot of like distribution and selling. Bruce, on the other hand, had done a lot of, as I would call it, um, self-started businesses. So he did a bunch of different things. But the last thing that he did before the winery was he had a home furnishing uh, stores. He had two stores down in the Santa Clara Valley. Um, and somehow Steve found this property, convinced Bruce to sell his business and his, and his, yeah, his two stores and to move up here to start making wine. Um, so in 1993, they made three wines. They made a Pinot Noir, a Chardonnay, and a Merlot. They were all $11 each. And um, people could come and just taste at any time. My boss had a, a barrel just like this pretty much for tasting. Um, so it wasn't until I would say about five years after that when they met Tom and Tina Maple that the, the, the vision and the like kind of the present day Armida that you kind of see now was, was, was kind of kind of born. And so at that point, we realized that we should specialize in, in Dry Creek Zinfandels. We're in Dry Creek. We made a, a fun brand called Poison. I think of you guys have all seen that it has the skull and crossbones on. It. Uh, we had some fun parties here, heaven and hell during once again, this passport weekend that we would normally be, be having right now. Um, and so they were able to somehow combine really good, affordable wine with that fun, no snooty atmosphere that Armida still has today. Um, it's really cool to see. I love inviting any of my friends and family out here. It's such a laid back winery um, where, you know, we have these beautiful views and I'll, I'll kind of show you guys that here in, in a second. Um, let me just kind of look over my thing. So yeah, guys, so what I want to do, let me just take um, two seconds to pull up a couple pictures on my phone. It'll probably look weird. I'll start like shaking the, the camera around uh, real quick. And then, um, and then we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll kind of wrap up and then we'll open it up for, for questions and our comments and are just kind of chatting, having a little happy hour kind of thing. So just kind of bear with me for a quick sec while I just pull up a couple of these photos. All right, bear with me guys. How's that look, Andre? Nice. All right, so here we are, guys. This is taken about four weeks ago. This is Bud Break, and um, this is out here at our um, Il Campo estate out at the winery. And this is kind of a, a fun kind of to, to chat about, like I said, with the um, us planting a couple different varietals um, besides Zinfandel and Petit Syrah. This one we actually can tell is Carignan because Carignan will start about two weeks before Zinfandel and Petit Syrah. So we always can tell when, when uh, the Carignan bud breaks because it's always kind of the, the first uh, to come out. So in that, that bud, which was actually that bud was created last year, um, you're going to have everything. You're going to have leaves, stems. You're going to have two clusters of, of grapes eventually coming out of it. And then here we go on to Verasion. So this was that process that I was telling you about earlier where you start seeing the color change. This is out at, at Tina's block, probably Zinfandel right here. You can kind of tell um, Zinfandel is, um, it doesn't ripen evenly at all. And so it's kind of the hallmark of it. And that's what's kind of cool is that usually with Zinfandel, you'll get even on one cluster, a little bit underripe and a little overripe um, with it. So you can kind of already see this starting to happen. Half of the, the cluster is still green. Um, but then you're also starting to see some grapes are almost starting to head towards being raisined. So, um, so it's pretty, pretty cool as far. So, um, so yeah, like I said, this is probably a little after July 4th um, out there. And there I am right around harvest here. So you can kind of see this is just a cool way to show you how old these vines are. I mean, just 110 years old. Each one's kind of pruned and shaped in, in a different manner. So it kind of like this one just happens to be like that perfect goblet where it kind of like created a little window for me. So uh, I kind of love that. And then if everything goes perfectly well, this is what it looks like once it's completely harvested. So 
Like I said, we've tried to remove almost every leaf, every bad looking cluster. And this is what just pure early morning old vine Zinfandel looks like uh, before it, it gets to um, our winery. And then here you go. Here's kind of part of my family. So every every year I'll try and uh, I'll try and bring the family out for one day of, of sorting. So the the what the grapes are on is that shaking table that I was explaining to you guys. So all those grapes are kind of coming towards you in the photo, and we're trying to uh, take a, a, as many of the leaves and just kind of bad looking ones um, out of it. Um, now this was taken a few years ago, but uh, my son is almost eight years old. My daughter's almost 11. Um, I'm going to be married for almost 15 years now. So it's um, pretty cool to like just once again, be able to kind of like incorporate the whole family within it because you kind of try and imagine yourself back in the days that this is how this has been done in Dry Creek. Like once it was harvest time, it was all hands on deck. Everyone that could was harvesting or helping out. Uh, and then if you see the gentleman in the blue shirt in the back, that's Bruce Cousins. That's our, our fearless leader who, um, he's down there for every, every um, bin of, of sorting. He doesn't, he doesn't know like the fermentation or too much of the, the winemaking side, but he knows what good Zinfandel grapes look like. And so he, um, he is one of our, our best sorters and it's just kind of great to always have him down there um, each year. And then here we go, this might kind of look funny, but so yeah, so this is if, if we're using an open top tank for any of this maple vineyard Zinfandel or anything like that, what we're doing is actually using this device that you see plunging down, it's, it's a punch down device and it's run off uh, pressurized air. So it actually just moves up, up and down. And so what we're trying to do is actually submerge those grapes back into kind of the wine. So during fermentation, what happens is you get um, a lot of carbon dioxide released from the, the yeast. And so what that does, that creates your bubbles like you have in, in champagne. And so those bubbles will cause all those grapes to, to rise. And so you'll end up with like a, a layer where it's all wine and then a layer where it's all grapes. And so when that happens, you can, you're really not getting too much extraction out of the grapes where all that color and all that flavor is. So then what we do is go ahead and at least twice daily, if not like three times, we'll go ahead and, and mix this up. Um, like I said, this one is what we call a punch down and you're just literally pushing down the grapes into it. The other way we do it is, um, is what we call a pump over. So you can see in my hand, I'm actually holding a hose right there. The other end of that hose is connected to a pump and the other end of that pump is connected to the bottom of that tank. And so all we're doing is literally taking the wine from the bottom and we're, we're blasting it or, or hosing it over the top to try and mix the, the wine and get it once again in, in contact with, with the grapes there. And then when that process is over, when it's two weeks or so um, of fermentation have gone by, then what we do is we go ahead and we drain the tank. So um, we want those, those seeds and skins to be separated from the wine. So any wine that we have drained out like right now is what we call free run wine. And so with that free run wine, we're at, that's what we'll use for our single vineyards. I think it's just the highest quality um, wine you can get. And then anything though, like about 30% of our yield is still locked up in those grapes. So we can't just throw away those, <laughs> those skins and stuff. So, we press those and a lot of times that will end up into our, our poison blend or our dry creek uh, blend. And it, it's not bad wine at all. And it's kind of one of those great things that when you're drinking a bottle of that poison, I'd say about 60 to 70% of that fruit is from Maple Vineyard. So um, it's kind of what makes that, that wine really good as well. So what we'll do, we drain the wine out, put in a different tank, and then I'll, we'll open the door and you can kind of see my shovel there where I'll actually shovel just a little bit out. And then, um, yeah, this photo was taken about two seconds before I jumped feet first into this tank uh, and began shoveling the rest out um, into bins to, to be pressed. Uh, so that's kind of the, the fun part, I would say, of harvest that I, I enjoy the most. And so, yeah, to give you guys, this is an idea of what the inside of the press uh, looks like. So this is obviously, these are white grapes. This is our Sauvignon Blanc. 
But you can see on the left side of the photo, you actually have the, the bag that inflates. It's obviously not inflated at this time. Um, but yeah, and then on the right hand side, you have screens that allow the, the juice to, to fall through, but not the, uh, the skins and seeds. So what we'll do is we can actually set like a program for how long and what different types of pressures we want this uh, press to press at. And so we'll load this whole thing up with all those red skins press it for about an hour and a half and then empty it out. And at that point, the skins are, they're, they're dry. It's like, it feels like compost. And that's basically what it is. We'll either put it into a big compost pile or we'll just begin to spread it back out in the vineyard so that what nutrients are left in there are gonna hopefully go back into the soil and, and help out future uh, years of this. And then we'll go to barrel. So that's kind of, kind of it in a nutshell once it gets down into barrel it's kind of like a little sigh of relief for us for sure because uh, all this hard work has gone into it and then at some point you get to just aging and where it's just sitting there and just aging and so um so yeah so and like i said we do most of these zins for about 16 to 18 months so um so aging is kind of the crucial part where you really want to make sure the wine is exactly how you want it when you want it, when it goes down to barrel. And so that you're not trying to like fix things later on, basically. And that's what kind of makes harvest so intense is that you really, that's your chance to be able to do any changes and make changes on, on any of the wines. Um, in the off season, you can only really mess things up. You can't, can't make it better really. And then just to give everyone, I don't know how many people have, um, have been and traveled here to our meetup. I'm gonna assume a few, quite a few of you guys, but here's like an updated uh, shot. We, this was sometime during winter, probably a bottling day where um, I'm up way too early, <laughs> but the pictures are, are always kind of good. Um, just to everyone, let everyone know about last April, about, yeah, about a year exactly now, we had a, an electrical malfunction in our beautiful deck that's out in front of the winery. It caught fire at about 2.30 in the morning. Fortunately, it was only the deck that burned. It wasn't any of our structural buildings at all. But it's taken us this long to go ahead and figure out what kind of plans we wanted to do with that area and with that space. And so we're right now in, in construction of... Um, designing a new new space where, where that deck would be. So if you, you haven't visited in a while, I have just a couple pictures here to just show you um, progress and, and how things are going. This, um, <laughs> it, it looks pretty funny. These are huge like concrete Lego blocks that are used as like kind of retaining walls and are gonna be able to kind of provide different little tasting areas uh, for everyone. So this is kind of the, the mess that it is kind of right now. Um, and this is what the, the final kind of structures will, will kind of look like these beautiful little spots where everyone can have their own little table, um, their own little kind of unique spot for it. And so, um, so we're all very excited. We're, we're hoping it, it coincides with, you know, the, the reopening of, of California and everything so that when people actually do have the chance to come and travel and, and visit us again, that we're going to actually get this really cool a uh, new experience out here at Armida. So, um, so big, big things kind of happening. All right, guys, I love it. Let me just kind of set this back up one more sec now. And so I just want to talk just a couple more quick things before we just kind of wrap up and, and, and get, you know, into questions and, and, and stuff like that. I wanted to talk about uh, Zap Zinfandel Advocates and Producers. It's a non profit organization. They're all about furthering the education and preservation of Zinfandel. So that's kind of their whole job. It was started by kind of the, the Mount Rushmore of Zinfandel producers back in the day. You had Ridge, you had Ravenswood, you had Rosenblum, um, Joel Peterson, all these, all these kind of legends started this group to help save Zinfandel, help preserve Zinfandel. And so um, uh, when I was at Peachy Cannon, I got to see what it was like, got to go to a few of those kind of big parties, big tastings that they, that they did in San Francisco. But as it kind of, those parties kind of started to dwindle, they went into more of the educational kind of aspect of it. So about five or six years ago, I was able to convince Bruce, our boss, to have our winery join again. Uh, 
give give back a little bit to that Zinfandel community that we've been a part of for so long. Um, and then about three years ago, um, my peers nominated me to their the board of directors of um, of Zap, and so um, that was definitely a huge honor that they uh, feel secure having you know the future of Zinfandel partly in in my hands and responsibility. Um, and just this last year, they promoted me to vice president. So. If you guys ever have a chance, look up uh, Zap Zinfandel, um, Zinfandel Advocates and Producers. It's a very cool um, organization and they do some really cool things that are doing a new thing called Zinfandel Trails, where let's say you want to go try Zinfandel and Paso Robles. They have like a few itineraries all set up for you to go to travel around to like five or different uh, wineries to, to try Zin in different areas throughout California. So, um, so kind of a cool little tool for you to um, further your, your love of, of Zinfandel. And then just the last thing I think I'll, I'll talk about just because I imagine we'll get a few questions was um, how have the wildfires affected uh, you? And so this, this also requires a quick sip here, guys. Whew. Well, yeah, it was a year last year. But we've had, we've had wildfires in 2017, 2018, 2019. All of them were in the, the later parts of, of October. Um, all those years I had all of our grapes picked before, um, before any smoke touched any of the grapes. 2020 was the first year where fires were, were here and smoke was here before we had any chance to pick any, any grapes in the, in the middle of August. Um, we had the fire that was right, it was the Wall Bridge fire right behind us. We, it got to about a mile and a half uh, away from our winery right here. Um, and basically just the area was just blanketed in, in smoke for almost, almost two weeks. Um, Sonoma County is so huge that, I mean, it wasn't everything that burned and there were not every vineyard was affected. Uh, in the same way at all and different varietals like reacted differently. Um, but there were a few cases where we did find um, smoke taint in our wines, uh, especially our red wines. And um, we chose, <clears throat> pardon me, to have those wines actually uh, destroyed. They're not exactly destroyed, but they're distilled into high proof liquor to be used uh, industrially <laughs> kind of thing. So um, so even if let's say we are all together and doing this past four weekend right now, unfortunately, there would be no reds to, to taste out of barrels. So, um, so right now the, the winery is not, we're not feeling a pinch. We just started pouring these 2018s. We just finished bottling our 2019s that are going to be released next year. So there's still a little bit of time before we're going to start feeling this pinch. Um, and you're going to hear this from myself and from other wineries, but, uh, you know, stock up <laughs> is, is my suggestion on these 18s and 19s. Not only were they um, like a great vintage um, as far as the wines made from them, but the fact that 2020, there's just going to be such a reduced amount of, of wines available um, that um, I would say it is, it is worth stockpiling. Um, just a little bit so um so kind of on that note unfortunately there won't be a tina's block there won't be a maple um one of the things there will be an il compo it will just be in a different form uh they one of the things that we did understand about how the smoke in um interacted with the grapes is that it was on this the smoke was in the skins of the grapes and so if you fermented on the skins, like I had shown you where you're mixing it and everything, the smoke became very prevalent. But if you had a white wine or if you press that wine immediately into rosé, the, the skin contact wasn't great enough to have any smoke exposure end up in the wine. So instead of making a, a, a dark, rich red wine, El Campo, Ended up making a rosé this year. Um, Andre and I are gonna bottle it in about four weeks. It's it's a beautiful wine. It's obviously not what we expected. We kind of threw, uh, you know, took took the curveball and tried to hit a home run with it for sure. But um, 
it just kind of goes to show you, and I think this kind of gets back to why has Zinfandel survived for so long. I think a big part is that it is versatile and that you can make it into a rosé, let's say, in cycles where maybe there's too much red wine out there. Um, and so we kind of saw like that with our, our own eyes. So it'll be kind of bizarre, but in um, probably in, in June of this year, we'll be selling the 2020 Il Campo Rosé and the 2018 Il Campo red wine actually at the same time. So, um, so yeah, so there was definitely, I would say those fires, we, it kind of caused us to like shift our, 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 um, how we were doing our, our protocols and procedures for winemaking, but then also even trying to do that, it, it didn't end up salvaging some of the wines. And so, um, so like I said, without making a, a Tina's and a maple, I still had to still pull off one barrel of Tina's because I just felt like it, the wine had been made for 110 years. And if I wasn't going to be the one that was going to skip a vintage um, on it. So I'm going to have this barrel hanging out here for probably the next couple of years just to like see how how it evolves and what it tastes like. So if you guys are are intrigued and interested on it, you know, um, I'll have like secret samples for you guys when you when you do show up. But um, but I would say these, these fires definitely, um, they caught us as California industry as a whole, I would say with our, our pants down a little bit, there wasn't enough research being done, um, on it. And so we had to rely pretty heavily on, on Australia for what research they have on, on smoke tain in, in wines. And, um, but I think it did end up furthering it where the, the research is going to be out there now. And you kind of saw once again, the, the community kind of step up. So uh, the winemaker over at Bella, like I said, that also makes the maple. He started this email chain that must've had about 50 different winemakers on it. And everyone started just putting in their data points that they, they had about what they had heard about the fires or this or that. And so um, it became like a very collaborative effort. And it's always kind of really cool to see in this industry that, um, that that can still happen, that there's really no secrets um, kind of out there. And so yeah, I wanna thank everyone for your support. I'm gonna go ahead and, and start asking Andre for a couple of these, these questions and everything, but um, I wanna say thank you to you guys. I, I miss you guys as, as customers. I miss the interaction. I miss being able to show off something new that we're trying um, and for you guys also see, to see, get that education of what a young wine, like when we're barrel tasting, tastes like, you know, in comparison to its, its bottled um, finished kind of counterpart. And so um, I really look forward to kind of hosting you guys here again soon. Um, I will send a follow-up email to this. Um, and hopefully this has been recording the whole time. And um, that way, if you guys want to share this recording or go back and view it at, at all, um, you can totally go ahead and do that. I'm going to also keep the, the three bottles special up for probably another uh, week. Um, and I'll send that link also on the, um, on the email. So if there is anyone else that wants these three bottles for 99 and, and free shipping, or you want to send it as a gift or Mother's Day, Father's Day, whatever kind of thing, um, I'll definitely leave this up for, for another week, but, um, I just got to say once again, just thank you guys. This was kind of my, my brainchild of like trying to figure out how to like email all you wine clubs to see if you guys actually wanted to do this. So <clears throat> pardon me to have this, um, go so well and, and smoothly. I, um, I'm, I'm very excited and excited and appreciate that you guys took the time to to listen to our story and and kind of what we're we're doing here at armida so thank you and then yeah andre what do what do we got for questions brother all right great job brandon i think you know i speak for everyone when i say that that was a really entertaining informative uh presentation of of what we're doing here at armida so I, I'll be asked, uh, reading some of the questions that you folks have asked during the presentation. Um, Brandon may have already answered some of these to a certain extent. So uh, the first question is, um, if only two, three acres of maple Zinfandel are used in the final blend, what are we doing with the rest of the wine? <laughs> 
That's a good question. And, and so, yeah, so what that does is that will go into our dry creek um, blend. So we, we make our, our poison um, um, wine, you know, each year. Um, and then also we've started doing the, our, I call it the Armida dry creek in the, in the white label that doesn't have the skull and crossbones. Um, but each year we're up to maybe somewhere between, I'd say, 3,000 and 5,000 cases of, of those wines. And so um, with maple and like Tina's block is about 500 cases. Maple uh, will be lucky to do about a thousand cases um, each year. So for us, we purposefully bought that much maple knowing that most of it is actually just going to end up in our regular, regular old uh, kind of dry creeps in that, um, you know, you guys probably know poison 198 a case and free shipping. It's, uh, it's kind of, I call it our Tuesday wine, but it is just a fantastic red wine um, that's drinkable at any point. All right, and uh, so the next question is, is about um, the smoke that we had in 2020. So does this have a lingering effect on future years? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, it doesn't, uh, not out in the vines actually themselves. So even if like our vines here had um, smoke um, on them or whatever, they're not gonna automatically be, be smoky this year. Um, the, to kind of like maybe talk about smoke taint just a little bit more, you, you can kind of sense it and taste it a little bit in the wine, but it's one of those um, kind of chemical compounds that won't get better. It will only actually get worse as the wine ages. So that's why a lot of people in the industry right now are still like kind of on the fence about what to do with their wine. Um, so it will be interesting to see I guess those kind of lingering effects of how does the smoke and the wine actually end up either staying in it um, and getting worse or kind of staying the same or what, but that's kind of the thing. We don't really have too much uh, examples or, or to, to be able to kind of like base any of these theories on, but we should be, as long as there's no fires this year uh, in 2021, we should have zero smoke taint issues to deal with. So when we're, you know, drinking the Tina's block and, and also drinking the maple vineyard, we notice that they taste very different. So what is it specifically about Tina's block that makes, makes it taste so much different than, than the maple vineyard blend? Good question. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'd say it's, it's mostly the other varietals that are in there, the, the Carignan, the, the Cinso, the, the Petit Syrah, when you get, that's in the, the Tina's block, when you get to the rest of the maple vineyard, I would say it's about 95% is in with maybe about 5% petite Syrah in it, but it's pretty kind of uniform throughout those other acres. But it's only Tina's block that has that like high, high percentage of, of another varietal that really causes it, I think, to be just like more floral, um, just have <laughs> just opposite flavors, even though the blocks that we're picking from are literally just, you know, five feet from each other. Um, the, the main difference is going to definitely be from, from those varietals. And then when you talk about maybe more nuances, I think the French oak that's, um, in the Tina's block also, um, gives it a little bit of a different flavor. Whereas maple, I, I like I said, I try to use all three different types, but I'll lean a little heavier on the American oak, um, side with, with maple. So kind of some of that is purposeful to try and make them just a little bit different. So it's not like, Hey, these two taste similar. So, uh, but then part of it is also just me being very hands off and trying to just, um, let the wines evolve and kind of like do what they can. But with the, uh, the Tina's block, it's a one shot, each or one tank. There's no, there's no blending involved besides what's out in the, the vines themselves, whatever everyone kind of picks. And so, the maple though, that one does allow me to do some, some blending kind of near the end. And so that will kind of also result in, in different flavors, I'd say each year. So we had a question about um, aging Zinfandel. So um, someone wrote that a lot of experts say that Zin doesn't age particularly well, maybe compared to Cabernet Sauvignon. So what is it? about Armida Zinfandel that allows it to age for, you know, up to 15 years? 
Yeah, oh, that's a <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. Um, well, number one, I've only been here eleven, so I don't know if it does last fifteen years. But no. um, it, it is. It's something about um, a few of the processes that I was talking before. Number one is being minimizing oxygen pickup. So anytime you do get oxygen into the wine, it's beginning to oxidize. It's beginning to age. It's like if you were to cut an apple and it starts turning brown, you can't make it unbrown <laughs> again, basically. And so that's kind of our, our biggest key is that if we're preventing any oxygen from touching this wine, it's going to actually like kind of almost lock it, um, its freshness almost in until you guys go ahead and kind of give it that, that breath of, of oxygen. Um, and then as far as like Zinfandel and the, the aging of Zinfandel in comparison, it really is almost personal preference. Um, my previous assistant winemaker loved Zinfandel's young. He loved how fruity they were. He loved um, just kind of the, the youthful exuberance of a, of a young Zinfandel. Um, where for me, I really think about five to seven years feels like my like sweet spot where if I open that wine, I'm like, wow, yeah, that's, that's how I intended it to be. Um, once you get past those seven years, I think you start getting what I kind of call tertiary flavors. So other flavors that I didn't personally like intend on, it's just from the, that natural aging of the wine. So the wine will just kind of begin to taste older. Um, so I think some varietals like Cabernet, I think lends itself where it's not too approachable at its youthfulness. It has a lot of harsh tannins on it. But after about, let's say 10 years of aging, that tannins actually like really kind of smooth out and that wine totally becomes imbalanced. I think the zinc is kind of imbalanced from, from the start. And then, yeah, as you do get aging, you do get different flavors. And so it just depends. I, I think um, for me, I, I love a, a zin that can age over 15 to 20 years that I've tried. I think it's like a cool um, piece of history, you know, to kind of uh, like a time capsule to kind of check on. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, I love that, but people definitely will, um, will argue when it comes to, to what the ageability of Zin, um, kind of should be. So we have a, a couple questions about, um, about maple vineyards. Um, so the, the first that was just asked was, um, why doesn't the rest of maple vineyard um, why isn't it planted to other varieties like Tina's block is, or maybe it is planted to other varieties and what are those other varieties? Yeah, yeah good, good question. question. Um, sorry. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I would say um, there is like a one acre section where they did actually plant just Petit raw at Maple Vineyard. So um, it does have like one section that does have, I'd say, other grapes. Um, otherwise, I think everything was just how it was when Tom and Tina got it. So whether it had Fidel or, or some Petit Syrah kind of interplanted in it. Um, and then like, why wouldn't they, they kind of change? I think the, the, the kind of legend of the story goes is that <clears throat> they were actually, the Maples were thinking that they would have to rip out uh, Tina's block because if they wanted to sell those grapes they wouldn't be able to sell it as a Zinfandel because there's so many other varietals in there that it would take someone who finds that that field blend uniquely cool and and wants to do it so when they were then expanding um, their vines they they definitely wanted to make sure that they had a, a high percentage of Zinfandel so that they can go ahead and, and sell it as Zinfandel um, but yeah, like I said, the only other varietal that I've seen actually like planted, planted is, is Petit Syrah. And, and um, Tom Maple was a big believer that if you co-ferment a little Petit Syrah with, uh, with Maple um, Zinfandel, it, it, it turns out amazing. And uh, it does, it, it definitely does. So usually I'll save our last tank because Petit Syrah is just a, a little bit slower of a ripener than, than Zinfandel. And so the last tank of maple is usually about 50% Zin and 50% Petit Syrah. And it's a, it's a big boy. It is a really cool wine. I don't know if it's an amazing wine to have on its own, but um, you put four barrels of that wine into the blend and it, it, it goes a long way. 
So with a, a vineyard like Il Campo or Tina's Block, where you have primarily Zinfandel, but also some Carignan or other varieties, are these varieties planted in one row or are they kind of interspersed throughout the whole vineyard? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, so none of this was really purposeful. So yeah, um, even um, uh, us here at El Campo with our, our Carignan, it really depends on what, what vines die first. So we're pretty much just replacing dead vines with different uh, varietals. There wasn't a, um, uh, like a purposeful planting to do like three rows of Carignan and three rows of Petit Sera and three rows. So it pretty much was Zinfandel and Petit. And then now as things are evolving, uh, then we start sprinkling in a few of those other varietals, just, just kind of randomly, wherever it kind of happens, there's really kind of no, no rhyme or, or reason kind of to it. And then uh, we have a couple more winemaking questions. So the, the first part is where do we get the wine to, so when we're topping up barrels, where do we get that wine from? And then do older barrels tend to evaporate more wine than new barrels or how does that work out? Ooh, that's a, a great question. Definitely a good question. So yeah, whenever you, you make a wine or whatever, it's never like perfect where you just put that last drop and it tops up that, that last barrel. So it usually ends up, let's say, being like a, a partial barrel like this. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll actually transfer it to a stainless steel barrel, just this one partial barrel, transfer it to a stainless steel barrel. And what that allows us to do is then put a blanket of inert gas on top of that wine. So whether it's nitrogen or argon or carbon dioxide, it will totally preserve that wine without getting um, any oxygen to it. And so then when we um, go ahead and, and top that wine, we'll actually pressure, pressurize that, that little um, stainless steel barrel and go ahead and it's like a little, little wand or a little topping wand, we call it. And you go ahead and, um, <clears throat> and top all the barrels with it. So this kind of becomes Andre and ours like a uh, logistical nightmare because then you have a barrel for maple and you have a barrel for Il Campo. You have a barrel to top, you know, uh, Pinot Noirs with. And so, um, so it does, yeah, like I said, become like a logistical nightmare. Once we're done with that stainless steel barrel and it's like completely empty, then we do, we gotta go, we call it breaking down another barrel. And so we'll use another full barrel and start emptying that one out. It'll probably only get down to just like a couple inches and we transfer the rest of it to a stainless steel because once again, we don't, we don't want any oxygen at all <clears throat> touching this wine. And then as far as evaporation goes, it's um, <laughs> but like new barrel versus old barrel and all these things. In theory, you're kind of like trying to replicate the caves in France. So a really like high humidity situation where there actually isn't much evaporation kind of happening. We don't have any caves here. Um, we don't have a humidity system really either. So I feel like we do get quite a bit of evaporation. But it's pretty hard to kind of notice between like a, a new barrel and an old barrel, um, which one's like evaporating faster. And so definitely I would say there are some theories where you could say like a real tight grain new barrel is actually gonna evaporate way less than a, a looser grained, a little bit older uh, barrel that's maybe just a little bit more porous. Um, but yeah, we've kind of tried everything and it just, yeah, there's real no rhyme or reason. Sometimes the, the barrel that's stored the highest will evaporate the most and the one below. So, um, so yeah, those are, those are kind of the, the factors as far as that goes. Brandon, can I interrupt? All right, and then to, you know, kind of wrap up the questions, when do we think um, construction will be done and open to visitors? Duh. <laughs> now you're getting into not my strength here. So, um, yeah, I would say they've been going pretty hard at construction, I would say, for about the last three weeks. I think we're really hoping for, like, this would be me being optimistic, maybe an end of June, um, full-on opening. Currently, we do have tables outside. Um, it's kind of exciting, I think, to watch. You can actually see all this, like, construction kind of happening. Um, but, yeah, we're open every day right now by appointment only. So that's the one thing that has totally 
kind of changed with our meetup. We used to be a little free will as far as you could just kind of come on up and we'd accommodate you. Now, based on like, like the county and state and whatever else is, is kind of controlling us, um, you have to go ahead and make an appointment. So um, that's right online, right on our website. You can do it fairly easy. I think you can book <clears throat> a month, month or two in advance right now. Um, but yeah, um, I would say stay tuned on our like social media channels to kind of like see maybe progress and, and hopefully um, check your emails for like when we're going to have a, an opening party and, and kind of things. Cause I imagine you guys will kind of be one of the, the first to, to kind of hear about it. So, okay. And I heard, I heard someone kind of chime in there. Can you, can you go ahead? You can go ahead guys. Anyone that wants to yeah. unmute Brandon, yourself and, and give us a chat, please go for it. Brandon, I'm sorry. I have to leave to go for an earth day cleanup. So I just wanted to show you, this is my, 2004 poison oh yeah and i've got the coffin that it came in <laughs> so, i love it i guess from listening to you it's okay to drink i've been wondering if it's all right to drink yeah yeah so i you know so i don't i don't know about the 2004 vintage but um i've been fortunate where you know i've had a few of the customers come and bring us some old bottles uh for me to try and um something about that reserve poison especially i'd say ages really well um i think it's a lot of the the new oak it aged about two full years in barrel compared to about the year and a half of everything else so it's kind of it's kind of set up to do a little bit more aging out of out of all those wines but i would say it's ready to go yeah if you want to if you find the 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 situation where the time is right, I'd say crack it for sure. I joined in 2006 and I've just been keeping it because it, it, I, I love the coffin. So I, 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 open it and drink it. <laughs> I hear it. And if you do get, um, yeah, that fear of missing out or whatever, we do have more. We still make the reserve poison uh, to this day. I would say 90% of the time, it's 90% uh, maple zin that's going into there. It's usually about 10 of my favorite barrels of maple that are just a little bit even better than the, the single vineyard stuff here. So it's um, kind of definitely a really cool one. I, I've never had the poison. Tina's block is my favorite. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining. Thanks for the support. I love hearing that. And anyone else want to chime on in? I think did I spend two, oh man, did I do two hours? What did I do? An app, something, just I'm, talking I'm not, to myself. I'm not, I'm not sure how long it's been, but I got to tell you, it's been fantastic. And you have been nonstop information that's been incredible. So thank you so much. Ah, I love hearing that, guys. That, that is awesome. Yeah, I always, I always wonder how much um, people would want to hear like all this information that we have in this um, you know, like by sending out that email, it's really cool to hear the response that people do. They really are, they want to know more about these vines. They want to have that connection. They want to be able to share it then with their friends and family and be able to tell them like what makes this wine so special and unique. And um, anytime I can help you guys out with that, I think that is just fantastic. So thanks for those words. Hey, Brandon, who do you get your barrels from? That's That's you a good use question. Different, uh, different varieties of wood. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So um, I would say I have about 13, maybe 10 to 13 different suppliers of oak. So different companies. So this one's like called the card. We got Sagun Moreau over there. Um, and pretty much I would say there's some companies that are, it's, it's just solely French oak barrels that you're getting from them. Um, so are they coming from Europe or are they coming from the United States? So this is, yeah. So this kind of gets into the kind of cool part. So this one, uh, Sagun Moreau, they're based out of France. They also have a cooperage here in Napa. And so you can actually get um, French, French oak barrels made in America. So they're still coopered, they're still toasted here um, in the USA. They're just aged out in, in France. Um, and then that Sagun Moreau, they also will do American oak as well. So, um, so I can order French oak and, uh, and American oak from them. Um, another company that I really like is called Tenellery O, um, and they're actually based out of Venetia, just about an, an hour away from us here in California. And same thing where they're actually importing the wood from France so that they can actually 
cooper it and and toast it and everything here in in california and so it's really cool because they're actually their their master cooper came and visited our winery about eight years ago tasted wines with me out of the barrel we kind of like were noodling some ideas he came up with like a different like level of toast that he wanted to do for some of our barrels and then about three months later he invited me down to come watch him toast our barrels for that year and so one of the coolest experiences for me to be able to see and if someone if someone ever offers you to go on a tour of a barrel facility take them up on it the smell is the most is incredible amazing yeah. thing we learned that in kentucky we learned that when we were going through the distilleries in kentucky uh, about the smell is just incredible have you guys ever thought about doing a uh thing uh-huh. like with um watershed or um bourbon bear or um oh i just yeah, like bourbon right. barrels or yeah, doing a bourbon barrel like from uh um buffalo trace or uh maker's mark right yeah so um usually i think our barrels are headed towards them and then they're charring them for you know bourbon and so it would be kind of ironic slash funny to have it have it come back but Um, I think it's cool. People are experimenting with it. I think with Zinfandel quite a bit, putting it in in bourbon barrels. Um, We just recently made a a pour uh, late harvest in from 2010 um, where I didn't use, um, you know, a bourbon barrel on it, but still kind of trying to go for those same types of of flavors. And um, it kind of shows that versatility of Zin once again, that you can make a a rosé to a a dessert wine um, completely. Mm -hmm. With with that that Rose same grape, so so yeah, so I don't I don't have anything that's heavy charred right now that um, that we're we're planning on on doing it, but I think it would be pretty cool to to give it a try, um, and then especially if you're kind of talking about you know maybe some of this stuff that had a little bit of smoke taint in it, and you add a little bit of you know smoke char from the bourbon barrel, maybe you know there's a certain customer group that's pretty kind of happy with that that wine, and so. We actually, like I said, we made a late harvest. We actually bottled the late harvest this year from 2010, but we also made um, a, a port this year in 2020 from some uh, grapes that were possibly uh, affected a little bit. I don't taste the, the smokiness on them. So hopefully um, it's just, yeah, it's just going to be a great dessert wine. But one of those barrels was a heavy toast. So it's not not quite bourbon. We're kind of getting closer to that ilk that we're talking about. Brand new. Hello. Yeah. I was raised with the Kincannons and the Winties and enjoyed them growing up as a young man. But I tell you what, you educated me more about wine than Jimmy or Joe ever did with me or with the other Winters families. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, absolutely. Well, I got to say, you know, I, um, I, I grew up and did most of my high school in, in Dublin in, uh, in the East Bay. And so um, heading out to Livermore Valley to, you know, was pretty much my, my first introduction into uh, the wine industry as far as that goes. So I uh, worked a little bit, I'd say, um, at Cedar Mountain was one of that my parents were pretty good friends with. But you start talking about Concanon and Wente and the history that's involved there. Um, that is special stuff. And so, um, but I do take a little pride in, in making myself accessible and really trying to kind of pull back the curtain so that you guys have as much information as I do. And you can kind of understand that. I would say my secret to making great wine is, is paying attention. I'm fortunate enough that someone pays me to pay attention to these wines, uh, you know, 40, 50 hours a week and 70 to 80 during harvest or whatever. So, uh, so thank you for those, those words. No, you're wonderful. Brandon, I just want to let you know that you, besides making great wine, you've done a great presentation. I've seen a few from some of your competitors and you've exceeded them all with information. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, I love that, guys. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for those kind of words, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, how's it going, guys? Hey. Can you hear me? Hello. I can hear you. Oh, hey. Just want to say thanks. Oh, hello. Someone's on right now. Tom, Jesus. You're back again. If you want to continue on, go for it. 
Hey, just wanted to say thanks for a great evening. It was uh, very informative. Appreciate you answering some questions. And we just wanted to say we've got six reformed Californians out in Saudi Daisy, Tennessee. So we enjoyed your presentation. I love a little taste of home. Yeah, for sure. I, I hear yeah. that. Well, that's that's really great to hear. And it was um, really cool to hear the response, you know, from uh, across the country. And it is, um, I think, like a really cool opportunity that, you know, obviously the the isolation and quarantine has kind of forced us to do a few of these Zoom kind of things. But I don't think it's going away because I think there's a lot of people who are on the East Coast can't just come here every year or every six months. And they but they still want this experience. They still want the taste. They still want to have the interaction with the, the winery and the winemakers. So um, as a platform, I actually like, it, it doesn't replace the real thing of face-to-face, of -face, but um, I do actually like that. I can actually show you also pictures of the vineyards and kind of also give you like a visual representation of, of what I'm talking about. So um, it's pretty cool. It's a, it's a new frontier that I'm, uh, just adapting to, and I, I think it's pretty cool. Well, thanks Thank again. You. It was great. Thank you. Brandon, tomorrow night, I hope you continue with the Zoom stuff, even after we're back to normal from the virus. Visiting is fine, but a few times a year, especially winter, this would be great. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, when I came up with this idea, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll do my three favorite wines. I'll do the El Campo, the Maple, and the Tinas. And then about last week, I'm like, okay, if I want to do this again, Man, I kind of like put all my best stuff on this first one, but, but look out for emails. I'm sure like in a little bit, I'll, I'll come up with an idea for a few different um, options for you guys, but I love doing this. So if you guys ever have like family members that you want to get together for a couple bottles and do just a quick little hour toast or something like that, I'm more than willing and, uh, and able to do that. So. Hey, just on that, can I say something? Yeah. I was able to, enjoy this with my twin sister in Denmark and her daughter and son and two grandkids in New York tonight. So this was fantastic. Oh, oh this man. Really now nice we're to be able to have a wine tasting with the kids there. <laughs> that, now we're crossing the Atlantic. Okay. That's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. And I think it is really cool. Um, you know, I've had kind of the same experiences with you know, my parents and my in-laws and stuff like that, where, you know, I didn't talk with my in-laws on the phone before quarantine, but for some reason, every week we're on Zoom for 40 minutes and it's, it's nice. It's actually really cool to have that, that connection and kind of like a, a forced kind of schedule of making sure that you're connecting with the, the people that you love and are interested in. Yeah. You got to say though, Brandon, you know, those people in Denmark, two, three in the morning, that's some loyalty to you. That's dedication for sure. So Brandon, uh, I love it. Yeah. We're from, we're from Georgia and we can't get out to California very often, but we've appreciated this. We've been long time winos. And my daughter, um, Stephanie and her family are here from uh, South Carolina and my granddaughter. So this has been really great. My son and his girlfriend are here and it's been a nice family affair. So thank you so much. Ah, oh, I love it guys. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of always the thing about it. I mean, the, the great part about wine is that hopefully it's going to be shared amongst family and friends. And sometimes it's celebrating, you know, life cycles and life events. And it's just very cool to, to have something where you can feel like a connection to not only have you come to the, the winery and, and, and seen the vines, but then also talk to the producer and the owner and, and kind of things like that. And then it's almost like you're, it's almost like a postcard that you get to like bring back from your vacation and share with other people. So um, I'm yeah. stoked to be part of that. And maybe one day you'll see all seven of us there. So I look forward to it. Absolutely. You guys let me know. Any of you guys, let me know when you're coming out here and I'll definitely give you guys a little VIP tour. It's always kind of fun to uh, kind of, yeah. Show you guys the barrel room, show you guys the tank rooms. Sounds great. So when is, uh, when is your next, uh, when is your next uh, video exhibition? Oh, I haven't, I haven't thought about it yet. Yeah, so um, I would imagine I'm probably gonna do something maybe in like mid-June. So uh, give me a couple of weeks to like come up with an idea. Get, 
Now you want mid May? <laughs> hey, if the if the demand there is, it's all about like supply and demand. If the demand's there, all right, I will gladly do it because, yeah, like I said, there. we're we're in Illinois. <laughs> it's getting dark here, and, and, and this is about our only stop. You know, there's no sunshine, there's no snow. It's kind of the in between season. We need we need our meter to keep us I, keep us alive. Okay. That's it. I'm, I'm definitely all right. I, I'm on it. Are you a, are you a Pinot Noir drinker too, or, or like what 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 topics would you be interested in? Just out of curiosity. I'm a Zinfandel drinker. I love it. Well, I got oh, more Zinfandels women, than we can do. So. Women drink Pinots. Sorry, the women drink Pinots. That's incorrect. <laughs> yeah, my, yeah. It's funny you say that the women drink Pinots. My wife, she always says she likes a Pinot because the Pinot comes up and says hi. I'm very nice. I'm subtle. I'm soft. I love you. You will you will like me. Whereas me, I like the Zins that come up and say, excuse me. Hey! That's <laughs> Zinfandel in a nutshell, for sure. <laughs> I think I, I, I'd like to say something. I've done about 20 of these in COVID, and this is the best one we've done. So awesome. Congratulations there. Hey, thank you guys. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Yes. I, I'm also from Illinois and I, I, I really appreciate you doing this virtual wine tasting. Um, I'm originally from California. At the, I moved from California 20 years ago and Armida wasn't in existence. And, and I have to say I was predominantly a cab, a California cab drinker. But since having found Armida, I strictly drink Zinfandels now, and and it's all it's all due to Armida, and and the fact that you're doing this virtual wine tasting really helps people that are not in California to stay connected in with your winery. So I really appreciate you doing this. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate the feedback. Like I said, I haven't done too many of these. Where um, this was the first one that I kind of organically was like, all right, who wants to do this? And um, yeah, the response was amazing. So thank you. No, I've got it all. Keep calm and drink wine, everybody. Go. I love it. Any other comments or questions, everyone? Yes. Is our meeting going to have a rosé? Yeah, so we're going to have a rosé in four weeks. So we had troubles kind of like figuring out the label and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, in four weeks, May 28th, we're bottling it. I'm All imagining right. like we're kind of chomping at the bit to like sell it as well. So you probably will see uh, an email the day afterwards for it. All so, right. Uh, do you still, do you still have any of the 2018 rosé left or is it all gone? No, all that, all the rosé, yeah, is, is gone right now. And so normally we, yeah, we only make about 200 cases of, of rosé um, and that seems to sell out really quick, but since we had to use the El Campo, we have about 600 plus cases of it. So we're gonna have this rosé uh, probably on special throughout the summer. So it's gonna be a little rosé summer, El Campo, bring it on. But you have to understand, those of us on the east side of the, the country, when it hit, you know, at northeast side of the country, when it hits 60 degrees, our, our opinion of rosé changes dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, Brandon, your your rosé, champ, uh, sparkling rosé was great. Oh my god! Yeah. Valentine's Day, it was wonderful. Oh, uh, yeah. that's another. Yeah, I love that sparkling rosé, and we actually, I think we have only about five cases of that left until we're gonna actually be, be disgorging some more in about two three weeks. Uh, we got about another hundred cases that we're gonna disgorge, and um, so yeah, that's also a really uh, fun wine uh, kind of to do. So. You're giving me ideas. Maybe we do like bubbles, Pinot, and a Zen or something. Maybe we'll hmm, we'll figure it out. Something fun. Are you still making the poison rosé? No, nope, no more poison rosé. Yeah, so that was seen, I think it was just like a one-off, I would say. Or I, I made it for two vintages, but yeah, it was one of those that we were hoping. We never sold it in the tasting room. It was only like distribution only. And so uh, that kind of gets out of my realm. Once it's getting sold like over 20 miles away from here, no, nah, I don't. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Market it as prosaic. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Did the bocce court survive the remodel? 
it's up right now and, it, and it's it's going to be there so i mean you can't really play on it right now but yeah it's it's going to be part of what that that finish plan is and in theory i think we might be extending it to be a little bit a little bit more official we'll get a little bit more uh, official length on the uh, on the later. on the court yeah exactly but yeah that that surprisingly kind of stayed throughout it didn't it, it, it wasn't kind of burnt down so um so yeah <laughs> it's just one of those little charms that we have it totally is yeah we had to decide what to keep and what not to keep and so like we decided not to just make like a really big wood deck again you know part of it i would say was kind of this covid you know situation where we had where we're like you know we don't want 200 people all squished and crammed together and so we just kind of really kind of separated everything out i think uh, we're gonna have an, uh, an area where we can put a long uh dinner table and probably have up to about 40 different guests oh. um so there's still like the option for that but uh yeah 200 people on the dance floor i think we're we're kind of past a few of those <laughs> days right now so yeah. how far in advance would we need to, to book a tour yeah i mean for for me um if you if you want me to go ahead and show you guys around if you give me like a couple weeks notice that that definitely helps out but if you're just kind of showing up just for a regular tasting, I would say as long as it's not a Saturday, I would say, you know, one to two days in advance is fine. If it is a Saturday, probably like a week in advance, um, we'll probably be fine with you. But yeah, if you um, if you like kind of know your travel plans or something like that, hit me with an email and I can kind of give you a couple of good times that that would work out. And we've been vaccinated. Hey, Brandon, I have a I have a suggestion for the next one. Can you send us each a barrel and we can do a barrel tasting together? <laughs> Right. I'm down with that. <laughs> That's a great plan. Uh, I know it is. It's pretty weird, you know, because usually <clears throat> the last thing before everything shut down was our barrel tasting weekend. So it has been, you know, about a year and a half since we tasted anything out of barrel and so um, with customers. So I, I am looking forward to it again. I, I, I kind of can't wait for it for sure. But I will tell you that we do also have a couple of fans that have really liked our wine. And I have one guy that he does buy a whole barrel. So if you want to know the price, five grand, you get the whole barrel filled with wine. It's about 25 cases worth of wine. Works out to like 20 bucks a bottle or something like that. And so if you're ever, if you're like ever like feeling it, so one of our customers, he he just brings the barrel home and then then bottles it in his garage, you know, the next day and then you get to keep the barrel and the whole thing like that. So it's kind of, kind of cool. You get to like pick your own wine. And so the last uh, two years he's chosen um, Il Campo. And so you guys probably understand why it's really great wine. So. <laughs> now, Brandon, you, you have been a terrific ambassador for Armida and you have just been knocking it out of the park when you did that virtual thing with Zap that, what was it, February? Yeah, that was awesome. That was awesome. Cool. And and putting Thank it you. together tonight, really terrific. The the one thing I would just uh, say was that you know when you ask for the the advance lead on people coming to see you, I have a feeling that's because you want to avoid divorce court. <laughs> that's exactly it. Yeah, I, I like to keep my weekends uh, to myself when <laughs> when it's not um, harvest. I love to invite people to be here at harvest when I'm here because. From literally, I would say the last week in August until pretty much Halloween, the end of October, um, I'm going to be here seven days a week. And it's always way more fun if you guys are touring at that time to be able to show you guys what I'm talking about and give you guys the smells of harvest and kind of the taste of harvest um, at that time. But yeah, when uh, when April rolls around, yeah, definitely the wife kind of wants me home Saturday and Sunday for sure <laughs> as, as far as that goes. Because I'm under strict instructions to bring back what's left of the, the anything that I tasted tonight, so that she can some of it. Absolutely, and I would suggest to anyone else if you have a little bit left over in your bottles um, from tonight, these wines should be totally fine for the next, you know, one to two nights, no problem um, at all. And um, I will probably do the same. I will bring these bottles home to the old, to the old kids, <laughs> to the wifey for the kids, so that they, yeah, yeah, basically how that works. 
All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and sign off and end this thing. Once again, you guys have been great. That was really cool. Thank you guys once again for the support. And um, look forward to an email from me, um, one just wrapping up this um, event that we had, and then one for the future tasting. Who knows what it will be? But thank you, guys. I wish you all the best of health, okay? Great Thanks, job. Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. <laughs>